Roger, roger, 595. Roger, roger, 73. All right, here we go. The uh, last half of uh, chapter nine, antennas and feed lines. Uh, one of the most interesting parts uh, of the entire course is tonight. So uh, we'll try to have a little fun and uh, also learn something along the way. Uh, are there any questions about anything we've covered so far? All right, well, let's get started then. And oh, oh, oh wait a minute, wait a minute. There's an interruption to the programming here. Uh, oh, there's a, there's a special bulletin. I, I, I don't know what you were talking about up here, but I wanted to make sure that everyone heard the breaking news. Uh, this is the date for those who are watching online, April 23rd, 2019. And just yesterday, something was born. Something new. A new digital mode. Has everybody heard about this? FT4. When I first heard about this, I thought, this is an April Fool's joke. My friend Matt, uh, NU4EDJ8 Oscar Golf, he texted me. But I followed the link. It's legit. Steve Frankie and Joe Taylor have come up with a new mode, new digital mode. And we all know how popular FT8 uh, is. This is a contesting mode, FT4. And uh, this is a, an announcement from the uh, Southgate Amateur Radio Club. There's a link at the bottom. You can follow for the, the full uh, notice. And it also takes you over to uh, the Princeton uh, website, Joe Taylor's uh, information page on, on, the, on the new mode. It's faster. Instead of the exchange being 15 seconds uh, per transmission, as it is on FT8, it's only six seconds. And actually, out of that, only 4.2 seconds is actual transmission. It's more sensitive than FT8, can hear into the noise better, 10 times more sensitive than radio teletype. Uh, it's a special setup of the software version 2.1.0. You have to actually do some manual manipulation, but it's designed for contesting. It's in the, the testing stages right now, but the way FT8 went, you know, like gangbusters, I, I expect that FT4 might actually get some uh, real traction. So you can say you heard it here first. We want to make sure that uh, everyone knows about what's going on. All right, let's get back to our regularly scheduled uh, chapter nine. So the transmission system of a radio station, of an amateur radio station, by definition we say it's everything after the output of the transmitter or the transceiver. So maybe you've got a bandpass filter that is on the, the output side, uh, maybe you've got a SWR meter, an antenna tuner, or antenna switch. All of that is part of the transmission system of your station. And so it's something that you have to keep in mind when you're troubleshooting. Uh, if you've got no signal coming in or going out, well, it could be any part of that transmission system before it reaches the antenna. So just, just to keep that in mind. And everybody remember why we do impedance matching? In order to transfer the maximum amount of power. You want to make sure that uh, the output impedance of the transmitter is matched to the output, in, to the impedance of the transmission line, matched to the, the antenna, if at all possible. Uh, if not, you uh, use an antenna tuner to make the, the transceiver happy and, and fool it. And when you have a matched impedance, then you have a pulse going from the left to the right, and it's fully absorbed. So if you're transmitting, that's your energy going out from your, your transceiver. Uh, none of it is coming back. Whereas if you have a, a mismatch, in this case it's a, an open line, you're sending out power and 100% is being reflected back. 
that would be a very bad mismatch. And you can have a, a partial absorption of power where some uh, of the power is going out and being uh, absorbed by the load, but in this case some of it is coming back. And you notice the polarity switched. That is, is an indicator that the um, load impedance is lower than the transmission line impedance. When that happens, you'll get a reflection, but the polarity of the reflection will shift. And you can see here in the, the most uh, dire case on the top, we have an open circuit, and on the bottom we have a short circuit. Well, a short circuit is certainly lower in impedance than the transmission line. So you see the entire uh, pulse is coming back and it's flipped in polarity. And standing waves. Uh, in this animation, if you look at the blue wave that is traveling out toward the antenna and a reflected wave, the red wave is coming back from the antenna, assuming left to right, then where they are uh, adding together, you have the black wave that doesn't travel, doesn't go anyplace, it stands right there on the transmission line. Uh, but uh, they uh, add vectorially and so that is a standing wave on your transmission line. And that's what you're trying to minimize. All right, going back to school. We're gonna learn our ABCs. Uh, well, maybe not. We're gonna learn some Greek letters. So, too bad we're not at Mythos now. So anybody know what that Greek letter is? That's Delta, indeed. And uh, I'm gonna turn it upside down though uh, in some of the drawings because this is what is known as a delta match and this is a way to impedance match to an antenna uh, from a lower impedance to a higher impedance um, and uh, it's a balanced impedance converter high to low impedance sorry i got that backwards um, so in this case uh, we have a feed line and you can see the, the uh, portions of the uh, exponential lines going out uh, that make up the, the delta match. Here's another look at it with a delta fed dipole antenna. So this is one of the impedance matching schemes that you can utilize, a, a delta match. Anybody know what that letter is? Maybe you can read it down there. That's a gamma. And so we have gamma matches. And the reason they call them this is because they kind of look like the letters. Uh, and so uh, a gamma match is one where you can feed an antenna with an unbalanced line and you can connect the shield directly to uh, the antenna. And then the inner part of a coaxial transmission line goes through a capacitor uh, and then a bar which acts as an inductor. Uh, and so this steps up impedance uh, and you can see the schematic uh, equivalent uh, diagram over there on the right. Um, so this is another way uh, that you can actually match impedance, uh, in this case from a low impedance up to, to a higher impedance. And one nice thing about a gamma match, have you ever heard of anybody who has a, a tower and they say, I want to shunt feed my tower. I want to I want to match my tower so I can make my tower a transmitting and receiving antenna on 160 meters. Well, this is how they do it, through the use of a gamma match. All right, we all know that one. That's from Ohm's Law. That's the Greek letter omega. And there is such a thing as an omega match. Uh, and uh, it's an L network. Uh, it's made up of uh, the variable capacitors uh, and an inductor preceding the, the load. Um, and it matches uh, only uh, um, loads with uh, the load impedance lower than the feed line impedance. So that's an omega match. So here's some comparisons. The delta match that we saw up on the top there. The gamma match, which is an unbalanced feed to an antenna. Uh, and then... Uh, there's also something called a T-match, and then the omega is over there on the, on the right-hand side. So here is an interesting trick that we used at the Voice of America. And you can use um, uh, open wire transmission lines are, are really uh, um, useful for this. You can add a stub 
which is just a short length of transmission line, or in our case, it was a copper uh, pipe. Uh, and you could add open or shorted stubs at points that you calculate. And by doing so, you can actually change the uh, system impedance of the antenna system. So if we had a curtain antenna that was giving a, a troublesome match at a particular frequency that we needed to operate on, we could go out, have the riggers go out, uh, and install plumbing, essentially. In install um, a stub uh, which would provide then uh, either a capacitance or an inductance, depending on the length, uh, and would match uh, the antenna better at the frequency we needed to operate on. And if you're operating in VHF and UHF, this is a trick that uh, you can do something called the universal stub matching. And because of the wavelengths, because they're, they're short enough, uh, even if you don't know what impedance your feed line is, or you don't know what the impedance of the antenna is, uh, if you have an indicator in your transceiver that tells you how you know, well matched you are, you can actually either have an open stub or a shorted stub connected to the feed point of the antenna. And just by varying where you have the transmission line on that stub, it will you, and you watch the, your SWR meter or whatever you're using uh, to calculate impedance match, and you'll see it go down to a one-to-one. -one. And so in w any antenna with VHF and UHF, since the stub length is pretty short, um, you, can, you can utilize this, and this is called the universal stub matching system. So I had uh, a um, high gain TH3 Junior, I think that's right. Um, and it's a three element uh, tri-band beam. And uh, the uh, middle, the driven element, was insulated from the boom. And in order to provide impedance matching for that antenna, uh, they uh, actually would make the driven element slightly shorter than it should have been. And remember we talked last week about antennas that are shorter uh, than their, their resonant point are considered to be capacitive. Longer than the, the resonant point inductive, shorter capacitive. And you can then add a hairpin, which is this U-shaped, right to the feed point. And you'd think that would be a short circuit. You'd think that would just short it right out and you'd have no signal. But at RF, it actually acts as an inductor. And so it doesn't short out the signal. Rather, it inductively compensates for the capacitance of the shortened driven element. And you can adjust it back and forth until you get a proper impedance match. So that's called hairpin matching, uh, used for a lot of uh, HF uh, Yagi antennas. All right, now we're going to talk about the transmission system. Remember we talked about that at the beginning where you've got a bunch of different elements that make up the transmission system. And some of those elements are going to have gains, like you might have a gain antenna. And some of those systems, like transmission line, are going to have a loss uh, per 100 feet or however long your, your you know, transmission line is. So what we have is the transmitter power output less feed line loss plus the antenna gain that gives you the ERP or affected, effective radiated power. And in fact, you'll, you'll hear a lot of FM stations, uh, broadcast stations, they are licensed by the FCC based on effective radiated power. So you, you find that your 100,000 watt FM station, you, know, you listen to the, the PBS station, well, really, their transmitter is only putting out about 20,000 watts. The rest is from antenna gain by squishing the pattern down and getting further distance because of the antenna gain. So this is effective radiated power. And so they ask you uh, to do some sample problems. So what is the effective radiated power relative to a dipole? of a repeater station with 200 watts of transmitter power output, 4 dB of feed line loss, 
okay? 3.2 dB of duplexer loss, 0.8 dB of circulator loss, and 10 dB of antenna gain. Well, it's a, simply a matter of uh, addition. You've got a, a negative 4, a negative 3.2, a negative 0.8, so you add those negatives up and you have a negative 8, plus 10, the antenna gain. So the sum of all of that is a gain of 2 dB. So you, you have 200 watts coming out of the transmitter and you, you increase it by 2 dB. Well, if you increased it by 3 dB, that would be a doubling of power. Uh, if you increased it by 1 dB, that's only about 20% increase. So you can do the formula, and you want to use the power formula, the 10 log P1 over P2, or you can go to a table like this, which you can find online or in various reference, and look at the power side over on the right-hand side, and we see that 2 dB is the same as multiplying by 1.58. And so knowing that, we can take that 200 watts, multiply it by 1.58, and that'll give us an effective radiated power for the station of 316 watts. So that's how you do ERP calculations. Let's answer some questions. Maybe we can do some more. So why wouldn't one need to know the feed point impedance of an antenna? To match impedances in order to minimize standing wave ratio on the transmission line and maximize power transfer. And what is the effective radiated power relative to a dipole of a repeater station with 150 watts output 2 dB loss, feed line loss, 2.2 duplexer loss, and 7 dB of antenna gain. Well, can we do this math in our head? So it's minus 2, minus 2.2, so that's minus 4.2, and plus 7. Let's say minus 4 and plus 7, so that gives us plus 3, approximately. And we start out with 150 watts, and it's times, if it's 3 dB, it's times 2. So 150 watts times 2. All right, what's the, the nearest one? So 286 watts of effective radiated power. There's a complicated formula in the book, but you don't need to learn it. If you can approximate, that's always a good thing, approximation. And the effective radiated power of a, to a dipole, uh, 200 watts out, well, we've seen this one already, 4 dB feed line loss, 3.2 dB duplexer loss, 0.8 circulator loss, so it's a plus 2 dB overall gain. Anybody remember the answer? 317 watts, correct. So I want you to know how to do this, but knowing the answer is sometimes okay for the test too. And what is the effective isotropic radiated power, whether it's a dipole or isotropic, it doesn't matter, um, of a repeater station with 200 watts, 2 dB feed line loss, 2.8 duplexer loss, 1.2 circulator loss. So let's add up the negatives. 2.8 and 1.2, that's going to be 4, 5, 6. So we've got a negative 6, and we've got a plus 7. So the net gain is 1 dB, and we're starting out with 200 watts. So it's going to be a little bit more than 200 watts, or 252 watts. And what term describes station output taking into account all of the gains and the losses? That's ERP, Wyatt ERP, effective radiated power. And what system matches a higher impedance transmission line to a lower impedance antenna? Listen how they do it. By connecting the line to the driven element in two places, spaced a fraction of a wavelength on each side of the element center. What does that sound like? 
that's, that's a delta. That's the Greek letter delta upside down in the diagrams, but yeah. And what is the name of an antenna matching system that matches an, okay, listen to this, unbalanced line to an antenna by feeding the driven element both at the center of the element and a fraction of a wavelength to one side. So that's the gamma match. You can use, you actually have the shield go right to the center of the antenna. And what is the name of a matching system that uses a section of transmission line connected in parallel with a feed line at or near the feed point? Popular with the Voice of America, that's the stub match. And what is the purpose of the series capacitor in a gamma type antenna matching network? Capacitance and inductance will cancel, so that's what we're, we're doing here in that. And how must the driven element in a three element Yagi be tuned to use a hairpin matching system? That driven element, instead of being right at the proper length for resonance, you might make it a little shorter in order to make the driven element capacitive so you can put that hairpin inductance across it and then you can adjust that hairpin for the frequency that you want. So what is the equivalent lumped constant network for a hairpin matching system of a three element Yagi? It's a big long question. What is that hairpin? It, the hairpin is an inductance. It's a shunt inductor in parallel, right. You make the antenna capacitive and you put that inductance in there. And which of these matching systems is an effective method of connecting a 50 ohm coaxial cable feed line to a grounded tower so that it can be used as a vertical antenna? That also is the gamma match. And what is an effective way of matching a feed line to a VHF or UHF antenna when the impedances of both the antenna and the feed line are unknown? What can you do? You can use that universal stub matching technique. All right, section 9.4, my favorite, transmission lines. So I didn't bring mine in tonight, but uh, antenna analyzers uh, this is the, the rig expert, um, or there's MFJ's uh, 259, we'll see one of those. But the beauty of these is that they have a built-in RF generator. They can generate their own radio frequency signal. This device is not for you to connect your transmitter up to. If you put your transmitter in here and you fire your transmitter up, you'll let the smoke out. That's no good. Uh, but you can use the antenna analyzers for single frequency measurements or swept frequency measurements over a range. Uh, you can interface some of the analyzers to a computer so you can then do charting to graphs or Smith charts. We'll talk about those in a sec. You can get a direct readout of the real resistive uh, measurement and the either plus J or minus J a reactance measurement. Um, and it's portable. You can carry it up a tower. You don't have to you know, do anything fancy. The other kind of um, measurement that you can do requires you to use a transmitter, requires you to generate RF energy from your transmitter. Uh, and this is a, a directional power meter. Um, and you're familiar with these, I think, from the general class as well. They use slugs that fit in the front of the meter. Uh, you see the little slug there with the arrow on it. Um, and the slugs are for different frequencies and power ranges. The, the meter itself, though, can be used with all of these. Uh, and the slug can be rotated so you can measure power in one direction, or you can measure it coming back in another direction. So you get forward power, and then you can measure reflected power, and then use the, uh, there's a little chart usually on the back uh, that you can calculate then and find out what the standing wave ratio is uh, on your antenna system. To reemphasize, to hook them up, the directional power meter goes between your transmitter and the antenna that you're testing. The 
antenna analyzer, this is the MFJ, goes directly to the antenna. No transmitter is involved. Here they have it hooked up to a dummy load. But so very fancy um, analyzers uh, that can tell you a lot more information about devices under test, whether it be a, an antenna system or a filter system that you're building or whatever, they're called network analyzers. Uh, and uh, this is a network analyzer connected to uh, a box on the bottom which is called an S-parameter test set. These are very, very pricey in the ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar range depending on what frequency uh, ranges uh, you're going to operate. But manufacturers need these in order to, to you know, check out circuits. Now, hams generally can't afford those, but they have something called uh, a vector network analyzer um, that is uh, more affordable. And I still don't own one of these. Last year I said I was going to buy one, but I, I haven't done it yet. But this is one that a, a ham in Germany has designed. Uh, it's under $1,000. Uh, and uh, it's got uh, output and input uh, and you can characterize the antennas or, or inductors or other uh, devices. Um, um, array solutions, I believe, sells some as well. Um, you need to look at the frequency ranges that they'll operate in um, and their dynamic range. The uh, thing about uh, these is if you notice the little uh, loads uh, that are down on the bottom part of the, the photo there, um, here's a little closer view. In order to calibrate a vector network analyzer, on the output port, you have to uh, put a, a specific open circuit load, have it do a calibration, a short circuit load, have it do a calibration, and then the load impedance that you want to normalize to, which is generally 50 ohms, you put that on and have it do a calibration, and then your ve vector network analyzer is calibrated. Um, and so there's an internal radio frequency generator and an internal low noise spectrum analyzer inside these. Um, the display is software running on a computer. So you can get some really interesting uh, uh, displays and you can measure things called S parameters. That box I told you before was an S parameter test set. These come from optics, but they're also useful in electronics. They're called scattering parameters and it comes from the scattering of light uh, and they can characterize a device under test having gain, how well its impedance matched, which is also known as return loss, uh, the voltage standing wave ratio, uh, the reflection coefficient, which is how well power is being absorbed, and device stabilities. Um, and the DUT, or device under test, is considered as a black box. And you just send signals in and measure signals coming out, and then you try to characterize what that device under test is doing. And the S parameters indicate the ports where a signal can enter or leave a device under test, and they're uh, indicated by the subscripts, so S11, S12, S21, and S22. These are what the S parameters mean, and we only need to know about two of them. So one thing that it, you can measure is how uh, much of a wave is reflected coming back from the device. That's called the reflection coefficient. Uh, and that actually can be derived from the formula you see down below. Uh, the, if you can measure the SWR, then the SWR minus one over the SWR plus one is the reflection coefficient. So you can go back and forth between the two. Uh, so that's one thing that a vector network analyzer can measure. So, S parameters. So here's my quarterback, number 21, and S21 is forward gain. If you're measuring a device under test, well, think of the quarterback throwing that football and having it received so he makes some forward gain. So S21 is forward gain of the device. And then here we are at desk 11, or S11. This is the return desk, or the return loss. This is also known as the reflection coefficient. Uh, and uh, this tells you how well impedance matched 
uh, the device is to the, the normalized impedance that you've calibrated your vector network analyzer to. So uh, S21, the quarterback, or S11, the returns desk, try to keep those in your, in your head. Another uh, piece of test equipment that is not found so often in an amateur radio station, but it could be, uh, used a lot in broadcasting, are RF ammeters. They actually measure radio frequency current directly. Uh, and uh, a lot of transmitters, for example, and a lot of licenses for AM transmitters specify uh, the time, type of load that the transmitter will be running into and the maximum amount of current allowed. They don't say anything about power, but they, they say this is the maximum amount of RF current. And so a lot of transmitters or uh, coupling equipment has RF ammeters built in. You can also buy an RF ammeter from MFJ, uh, and this has got a little toroid uh, at the top that you can clip around uh, a wire and actually measure the amount of radio frequency current flowing through that wire. Now, the exclamation point is there, you got to be careful, especially if you're running higher power levels, because um, that RF current can burn you. Uh, and so when using an RF ammeter, you, you have to be very careful whether it be in a piece of equipment or if you're using the MFJ. If somebody's transmitting and you're right up next to that antenna, just be very, very careful. So a mis mismatched transmission line uh, is going to have a forward wave, the reflected wave, and it's going to have, if there's a mismatch, the standing wave ratio is going to be greater than one to one. Perfect match is a one-to-one -one standing wave ratio, but any sort of mismatch is going to increase the standing wave ratio. Just a general concept. So here is an interesting <coughs> impedance matching device known as the quarter wave transmission line transformer. And here we have a, a transmitter that's, that's feeding, and the transmitter's got a 50 ohm output impedance. And your load over here, the ZL, has a 100 ohm impedance. Well, how can I get that matched? Well, what you can do is 100 ohms and 50 ohms, the, the median between those two is 75. So if you could find a piece of transmission line that has an impedance of 75 ohms and cut it for exactly one quarter of a wavelength long, then you'll get a perfect one-to-one -one match at that one frequency that you cut it. Now, there'll be some bandwidth. Be, you know, you, can, you move a little bit. But, um, so this is known as a transmission line transformer, and it can be useful for impedance matching. So radio waves in free space travel at or near the speed of light. But when we try to constrain radio waves uh, into coaxial cables or even into wire that has plastic insulation, well, we're going to start to slow things down because the, the plastics of the, the coaxial cable or of the insulation actually have an impact on the speed of the radio wave. So um, what we, uh, how fast the radio wave travels through a coax as compared to the speed of light, that's called the velocity factor. Uh, and so a velocity factor of one would be traveling at the speed of light. Uh, a velocity factor of 0.5 would be traveling half the speed of light. And it's determined by the plastics. It's determined by the dielectric materials used to make up the cable or to insulate the wire. Um, so cables make waves travel slower. So here we have a discussion about solid versus foam dielectric. Um, and coaxial cable can have different kinds of materials around the center conductor. And that's the dielectric that we're talking about. Um, solid polyethylene um, is really hard and kind of takes a, a lot of effort with a knife to even cut through it. Whereas foam dielectric 
is pretty easy you know, to cut through and to work with. Um, and it has less plastic density. It's got air bubbles in it. And, and so because of that, um, it uh, actually, uh, well, foam dielectric has lower safe operating voltage limits. It's not as good an insulator. Um, foam dielectric has a lower loss per unit of length, though, too. Uh, so that's something to consider. And foam dielectric has a higher velocity factor, meaning that waves travel faster through foam dielectric coaxial cable than they do solid polyethylene coaxial cable. Um, and that's shown on this chart. There's also on page 9-33 a, a similar chart to this. And you can see that open wire transmission line has a velocity factor from 0.95 to 0.99. That's almost the speed of light. Very little limiting on open wire transmission lines. But solid polyethylene has a velocity factor of 0.66, which means that uh, waves slow down in polyethylene coax. Well, why do I need to know this? Why is this important? Well, it comes down to making phasing lines. We talked about those last week. Or making stubs or other things. You need to know how long a cable is in wavelengths of the radio frequency signal that you're dealing with. And cables of different velocity factors will have different lengths. So here's the, a practical problem. What is the approximate physical length of a solid polyethylene dielectric coaxial transmission line that is one quarter wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz. So how do we solve this? So we know that it's 14.1 megahertz. So what is a wavelength in meters for 14.1? Remember how to do that? 300 divided by. So anybody got a calculator? 300 divided by 14.1. Okay. And so then multiply that by 0.25 because we want a quarter wavelength. Five point three two meters. We're talking about meters here, and now multiply that five point three two by the velocity factor of the coax, which is point six six. Three point five one. So, a coaxial cable of this type, a quarter wavelength at this frequency, would be three point five one meters long. So if you need to make a phasing cable that it has to be that long, um, or a stub that has to be that long, that's how you get it to the proper length. Did anybody get a chance to watch this video that I gave you a link to? If not, it's highly recommended. Uh, standing Up for Standing Waves, uh, an episode of Ham Radio Now. And two points that they made to general rules. A quarter wavelength line, or coaxial line, or just a length of wire, a half wavelength line is an impedance repeater. So if you have an impedance here, and you have an exactly a half wavelength of coax, and you try to measure over here, it will be exactly this number. So a half wavelength of line is an impedance repeater. A quarter wavelength line is an impedance inverter, uh, meaning that if you've got a low impedance and you've got a quarter wavelength length of line, then you'll have a high impedance over here. Or vice versa, if it's a high impedance, you'll have a low impedance. Um, so let's consider the case of the half wave dipole. And we, we've all, you know, looked at half-wave dipole antennas. You know, when I talk about them, I have to go like this, all right? So, oh. and of course, we've got a, a coax or a, a transmission line here feeding it. Anybody remember the nominal impedance 
of a half wave dipole antenna? 36. No, that's a, that's a quarter wave vertical. Double that. 72 or 73. So the, the normal impedance here at the center is, is going to be around 73 ohms, 72 ohms, something like that. Anybody ever think about why is it that? Out here, you've got no connection to anything. All right? The impedance at this point on the antenna is going to be very high. Remember, I asked you to think about impedance as the ratio of volts to amps. You can have very high voltage out here, but you're going to have very low current because there's no place for the current to flow. So this is going to be a high impedance point. Likewise, over here, it's the same way. This is going to be a high impedance out there. And we said this is a half wave dipole antenna. So one leg is going to be a quarter wavelength long. So high impedance here becomes a low impedance over here. High impedance here becomes a low impedance here. And so this is a transformer. It's transforming. And so that's why at the center of a dipole antenna, it's the lowest impedance point. So just keep those general rules in mind. Anybody take a look at this table and go, what the heck are they talking about? <laughs> so, if you look, this is the, the table on page 9-40, if you want to turn to that. And I want you to look where I have on the right-hand side there, the little arrows in length in wavelengths. And it starts out, I believe, I don't have my glasses, it's a quarter wavelength is the first length. No, eighth wavelength, eighth of a wavelength. Um, and it, from right to left, it goes eighth of a wavelength, quarter wavelength, uh, three-eighths, half, and, and so on. And so this is for open lines. And what it's showing you up above is that a quarter wavelength long line behaves like a capacitor, which is a handy thing. Because maybe you need a capacitor of, of a certain value for tuning purposes for your, your loop antenna, but you don't, in your junk box, you don't have a high voltage capacitor. Well, you can make one out of coax cable. And by cutting it to the proper length, you can get the capacitance you want. Um, so in this case, you, you have a line uh, that is open and it becomes a, a capacitor. Now, if you go a little longer, if you go out to um, a quarter of a wavelength, but remember we said a quarter wavelength line is an impedance inverter. So if it's going to be open at the far end, it's going to be acting like a short circuit, also a series resonant circuit. If you look at the very top of the, the graph, you see that in those um, waves up there at the top, that's the impedance. So it's going to start out as a high impedance and go down to a low impedance, back up to a high impedance again, based on the length of the cable in fractions of a wavelength. If you go to a half wavelength, for example, it's going to behave like a high impedance open uh, circuit or a parallel resonant circuit. So what they're telling you here is you're going to have high impedance, low impedance, high impedance, depending on the length of the cable, in this case with open lines. Now there's another table on the, the next page which considers the case of shorted lines uh, that you actually put a, a physical short circuit at the far end. And how does that behave? Well, uh, a quarter wavelength shorted line behaves as an inductor. So you need an inductor for a circuit? Well, you can make it out of a length of coaxial cable. Um, you go a little further on and the uh, shorted circuit is going to behave like an open circuit or very high impedance, and so on as you go on down the line. So it's not as baffling as it first seems. 
Just remember that an eighth wavelength open line will behave as a capacitor. An eighth wave shorted line will behave as if it's an inductor, which can be kind of handy. A three eighths wave open line will appear as an inductance, and a three eighths wave shorted line will appear as a capacitance. So sometimes uh, you want these links because they're they're practical to get the amount of picofarads of capacitance you need, um, um, and the the shorted uh, shorter line isn't enough. Uh, this this is a way that you can do it. All right, anybody remember nomograms? Nomograms were representations um, uh, of a mathematical formula um, that uh, you could actually use a ruler. And if you knew two out of the three variables, you could find the third. So here I have for you a nomogram for Ohm's law. So you use a ruler and you, you have the two variables that you know and you find those on here and you plop your ruler between those points and then you can find the third. Anybody remember these guys? This is a nomogram or a series of nomograms. Uh, and instead of using a ruler, you actually you slide the nomogram back and forth you, you, you know, have the two variables and, you, and then you find the third. So nomograms are, are very you know, handy representations of mathematical relationships that you can put down on paper. Okay? I am now going to induct you into the secret society of amateur radio. You have now completed enough learning that you are ready for this step. I have to ready myself. Stand by. No laughing. This is serious. All right. Very secret information. Only the most advanced hands. This is what you got the extra for. Don't tell anybody. The mother of all nomograms. The Smith chart. Very few people understand the Smith chart. And they're in your book as well, but I just thought I'd give you one. And this is available on the web. I'll send you the link. So if you want to download these as a PDF uh, and, and print them out, you can. So Philip Hagar Smith, the gentleman you see uh, pictured here, he is the father of the Smith chart. And he said, from the time I could operate a slide rule, I've been interested in the graphical representations of mathematical relationships. And uh, so here we have the Smith chart. It's all about impedances and standing wave ratios. And it's made up of constant resistance circles and constant reactance arcs. Uh, if you look at the outer part of the Smith chart, it's uh, indicated in fractions of transmission line length uh, as a fraction of wavelength. Um, and the chart in your book is on page 9-38. The discussion of the Smith chart starts on 9-36. So if you look closely um, at the Smith chart, it's kind of like you're looking down a cylinder, if you, you kind of look at it there. In fact, I thought it reminded me of this. Anybody watch the old TV show, Time Tunnel? 
you're going down the tunnel. That's what I thought it was. So let's kind of simplify the chart just a little bit. So the only vertical line that's on the Smith chart, that horizontal line, that is known as the resistance axis. And so if you have a device that has an impedance, a part of that impedance is going to be resistive and a part of that impedance is going to be reactive, either inductive or capacitive. Well, if it's resistive, that part is put down on the resistance line, on that uh, horizontal line. Um, and inductances, inductive reactances, are above the line and capacitive reactances are below the resistance line. And infinity, as far as in infinite resistance, is to the right-hand side, like you're looking down that infinite cylinder, and zero resistance, or a short circuit, is on the left-hand side. So you've just learned all there is to know about the resistance axis. That's that line that goes from zero to infinity. That's, that's a lot. And anywhere along these circles that you see drawn uh, means that at that point there's, that's a constant resistance. Now, Gary, why doesn't you know the center of the chart is at one? I don't. I'm not going to be dealing with one ohm all that often. We'll talk about it here a little. But but what you do is you normalize the chart. And what that means is, let's say we're working with a 50 ohm system, which we typically do. Then you assign the one position, which is called the prime center, to be 50 ohms. One times 50 is 50. Um, the 0.2 position then is 0.2 times 50, or one. And so you, you actually you normalize the chart to your particular value. You can buy Smith charts that are already pre-normalized for 50 ohms. So we looked at the resistance axis and the resistance circles. Then reactance is measured on arcs. And above the resistance axis are inductive uh, reactants, and below are capacitive reactants. And notice that there, um, plus 1 or plus 0.5 or plus 0.2, those also are normalized values. So if you're dealing with 50 ohms on the resistance axis, then that plus 1 reactance axis is going to be plus 50 ohms inductive reactants. And so inductive reactance is then the same anywhere on this arc. Conversely, on the bottom, capacitive reactance. The, the same anywhere on that arc. So these are called resistance arcs. And the circle around there is called the reactance axis. So we have the resistance axis as the straight line, and the reactance axis is the circle all the way around the chart. And yeah, as we said, the outer circle is the reactance axis. So point one zero on the chart there, that's called the prime center. And normalizing the chart, like I say, you can normalize the chart to 200 ohms if you want, whatever value it, it suits your, your purpose. Um, and then the other points are multiplied in exactly the same way so you can actually read their values or, or chart their values as well. One neat thing is that Around any one particular point, you can draw SWR circles. And what that indicates, um, let's just look at the resistance axis here. Um, if the prime center is 1, and you go to a resistance that's twice that, well, if you were going to try to load into that, the standing wave ratio would be 2 to 1, 2 versus 1. Conversely, if you go to the point 5, the ratio between them is, again, 2. So anywhere on that circle is a 2 to 1 
standing wave ratio. Anything within that circle is going to be less than 2 to 1. So if that's the parameter you're looking for, then you want all of the uh, measurements over a frequency range to be within that circle. Or you can have a 3 to 1 circle or a 5 to 1 circle. So these are standing wave ratio circles that you can add uh, to your chart. And on the outer ring, if you look, it says wavelengths toward the load or toward the generator. The load generally is considered the antenna, generator is considered the transmitter, um, and it's useful um, to calculate the impedance along a transmission line, which can vary. So uh, the Smith chart, to, by using the outer circle measurements, you, you can do these calculations. So why in heck do we want the Smith chart? Well, it's useful for impedance matching. We've told you about L networks and T networks and pi networks. Well, how do you calculate the values of those? Well, you can do it mathematically or you can do it graphically. And by um, increasing a series uh, inductance, you can move a point on the chart in one direction. By decreasing a series capacitance, you can move it in a different direction. By increasing a parallel inductance, you can move it in a different... So by making shifts, you start out at point ZL, but by making two shifts, by adding an inductor or a capacitor, you can move it to the prime center. Boom! You've just impedance matched that load to 50 ohm. And so that's what a Smith chart is all about. So, now I've showed you the nomogram, the mother of all nomograms, but if you prefer computers to paper, have I got a tool for you. It's called SimSmith. And it's a Smith chart on steroids. It's a Smith chart program that is available free uh, it was written by Ward Harriman, AE6TY, uh, and really complex, really powerful. Uh, and in fact, in order to learn how to use the program, I recommend the Larry Benko's uh, YouTube channel, W0QE, who's got a number of tutorial videos on how to use SimSmith. Um, but um, with SimSmith, you can actually um, design a circuit, you can add capacitors, you can add inductors, you can change frequency ranges, and you'll get readouts right on the screen uh, in real time. So it's really, really super powerful. Uh, and um, so now you know everything there is to know about the Smith chart and uh, also the Smith chart on steroids. And so with this, I will conclude our secret session and your initiation. Knowledge is power. Let's take five minutes. So we ended up uh, learning everything we could about the Smith chart. So now, let's see how we did. We have some questions. Which of the following is an advantage of using an antenna analyzer compared to an SWR bridge to measure standing wave? Antenna analyzers do not need an external radio frequency source. They have one built in, correct. And which of the following instruments would be best for measuring the SWR of a beam antenna? Out of all of those choices, an antenna analyzer is the only one that would be able to do that. And how much power is being absorbed by the load when a directional power meter connected between a transmitter and a terminating load reads 100 watts forward and 25 watts reflected? Simple math, 75 watts, yeah. What do the subscripts of S parameters represent? It represents the ports at, at which the measurements are being made. 
And what is indicated if the current reading of an RF ammeter placed in series with the antenna feed line of a transmitter increases as the transmitter is tuned to resonance? Remember I said some broadcast transmitters were actually specified in the amount of output current. The more output current you have, the more power is going to your load or to the antenna. See that? Okay. So how should an antenna analyzer be connected when measuring antenna resonance and feed point impedance? You connect the antenna feed line directly to the analyzer. So which S parameter is equivalent to forward gain? 21. And which S parameter represents return loss? Desk 11. All right. And what three test loads are used to calibrate a standard RF vector network analyzer? Short circuit, open circuit, and the nominal impedance, which generally is 50 ohms. And what term best describes the interactions at the load end of a mismatched transmission line? We mentioned it. It can be calculated from the SWR. It's the reflection coefficient. And which of the following measurements is, a, is characteristic of a mismatched transmission line? A matched transmission line will have an SWR of 1 to 1. So a mismatch is going to have one greater than 1 to 1. So which of these choices is an effective way to match an antenna with a 100 ohm feed point impedance and a 50 ohm coaxial cable feed line. This is called a transmission line transformer. And you have a piece of transmission line of a different impedance, the mean between 100 ohms and 50 ohms, and it's got to be exactly a quarter wavelength long at the frequency, so it's going to be C, yes. And what is the velocity factor of a transmission line? The velocity of the wave in the transmission line over the velocity of light uh, uh, in a vacuum, so the speeds, the comparisons. And which of the following determines the velocity factor of a transmission line? The plastics that are being used, and the plastics are the dielectric, being used as the dielectric. And why is the physical length of a coaxial cable transmission line shorter than its electrical length? Electrical signals move more slowly in coaxial cable, cable than in air, so, yep, it's going to be shorter in, in the cable. So what is the typical velocity factor for a coaxial cable with solid polyethylene dielectric? 0.66. And what is the approximate physical length of a solid polyethylene dielectric coax transmission line that is electrically one quarter wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz. Anybody remember? 3.5 meters. We did the calculation. And you can do the calculation if you need to. So what is the approximate physical length of an air insulated parallel conductor transmission line that is electrically one half wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz. 
Remember I said air insulated parallel conductor transmission line, the velocity factor is really high, almost one. So 14.10 megahertz, what is, ha what is the, the meter band? It's the 20 meter band. So a half a wavelength is going to be approximately 10 meters. That's all you really need to know. <laughs> That'll get you the right answer. So how does ladder line compare to small diameter coaxial cables such as RG58 at 50 megahertz? Ladder line always going to have lower loss because there's less dielectric material to, to take away any of the, the uh, energy. So what is the term for the ratio of the actual speed at which a signal travels through a transmission line to the speed of light in a vacuum? Velocity factor. Yeah. And what is the approximate physical length of solid polyethylene dielectric coaxial transmission line that is electrically one quarter wavelength long at 7.2 megahertz? Oh, we didn't do this one. You want to do this one? So what would be one wavelength at 7.2 megahertz? How would you calculate that? Remember the formula? 300 divided by 7.2, so let's do that. So 300 divided by 7.2 is what? 41.67 and the units? Meters. All right, so that's for one full wavelength. So we need a quarter of a wavelength. So what is 41.67 times 0 0.25? 10. 0.42 meters, and we're going through solid polyethylene dielectric coax, so that's times 0.66. How much? 6.9 meters. Let's look at our answers. Well, look at there. B, 6.9 meters. So what impedance does an eighth wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? An eighth wavelength long line that is shorted looks like an inductive reactance. That's correct. And what impedance does an eighth wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? It acts like a capacitor, correct. And what impedance does a quarter wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? Quarter wavelength lines are impedance inverters. So when it's open at the far end, it's going to look like a very low impedance at the other end, correct. And what impedance does a quarter wavelength line, transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted? Very high. very high impedance. It's an impedance inverter. Quarter wavelength lines are impedance inverters. All right, what impedance does a half wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? Half wavelength lines are impedance repeaters. So if it's shorted at the far end, it's going to be, which is the same as saying a very low impedance. A short would be a very low impedance. All right, and what impedance does a half wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? Very high impedance, correct. 
So which of the following is a significant difference between foam dielectric coaxial cable and solid dielectric cable, assuming all of their parameters are the same? Foam dielectric has a lower safe operating voltage, foam dielectric has lower loss, foam dielectric has a higher velocity factor, all of those correct. So which of the following can be calculated using a Smith chart? A Smith chart is all about impedance. And what type of coordinate system is used in a Smith chart? Resistance circles, that's one of the characteristics, and reactance arcs, that's another of the characteristics. And which of the following is often determined using a Smith chart? Yep, out of all of those, impedance and SWR values. And what are the two families of circles and arcs that make up a Smith chart? Resistance circles and reactance arcs. Arcs. All right, get out your glasses. What type of chart is shown? A round one. That's A, the Smith chart. And on the Smith chart shown, what is the name for the large outer circle on which the reactance arcs terminate? Remember, there are two axes in a Smith chart. The resistance axis is the straight line, and the reactance axis is the outer circle. So this is indeed the reactance axis. And on the Smith chart shown, what is the only straight line? That's the resistance axis. All right. So what is the process of normalization with regard to a Smith chart? It has to do with one point on the Smith chart for sure. Yeah. Reassigning impedance values with regards to the prime center, correct. And what third family of circles is often added to the Smith chart during the process of solving problems? Standing wave ratio circles, yes indeed. And what do the arcs on a Smith chart represent? Points with constant reactance, inductive reactance above the resistance axis and in, uh, capacitive reactance below. And how are the wavelength scales on a Smith chart calibrated? It's on the outer ring and it's in the fractions of transmission line electrical wavelength. Quarter wavelength, eighth wavelength, etc. All right, you made it through the Smith chart. Yeah. Last section for tonight, antenna design. So you don't actually have to build antennas anymore. You can actually build them on your computer uh, and then go out and physically build them. Always recommend you physically build them. Um, but the goal with antenna modeling is to predict an antenna's performance before you have to you actually go through the effort of building it. And you can try out different options and see what happens. And the software is based on something called the NEC, not the National Electrical Code, but in this case, Numerical Electromagnetics Code, or NEC. And one of the more popular uh, softwares is, I believe it's Roy Llewellyn, uh, W7EL, uh, he has the EasyNEC program. And uh, excellent uh, piece of software. It utilizes something called methods of moments analysis um, in which uniform currents in an individual antenna or wire, um, you, you slice it into segments and say there's an equal current in this segment, equal current in this segment, um, and so you have many, many segments that make up the entire antenna. Uh, and here's more information about MOM, if you want to know about it. Um, 
mean, variance, skewness, kurtosis. Huh? I don't know what that means. But anyway, mom, method of momus, just know that. So EasyNet comes in different flavors, um, and it's $100 and up, um, depending on, on what uh, options you get with it. Um, and if you go to any of the big ham fests, uh, sometimes uh, Mr. Llewellyn is there, and you can actually get a little sample CD uh, for a trial program uh, to try it out. But it's very valuable, very well uh, worth the money. If you're cheap like me, though, you can use this software, which I think is pronounced Managal. Uh, it was developed by some Japanese and German hams. It's free antenna modeling software. And you can download it and, uh, and run it on your PC and uh, begin uh, you know, modeling antennas right away. So some quirks of both types of software is that um, if you model an antenna you know, during a certain frequency range and whatnot, well, don't assume that its gain is going to be constant if you move out of that frequency range. Antenna gain will vary outside the model frequency range. That just kind of makes sense. And if you use less than the recommended 10 segments per half of a wavelength, then you're going to get probably the wrong feed point impedance. Uh, so you, you want to slice the antenna up even more uh, in order to get accurate feed point impedance. So what can you learn? We well, can learn your bandwidth of the antenna, the SWR bandwidth versus frequency. Uh, you can do plots in both elevation and azimuth of uh, the antenna's gain. Uh, you can actually uh, estimate the front to back ratio also of, of the antenna. And if you just you say, I want nothing but gain out of my antenna, I want the strongest signal, when you do that, you will lose front to back ratio. When you optimize an antenna for maximum gain, you, you also you know, screw up a parameter. So that's something to keep in mind. Oh, questions already. So what may occur when a directional antenna is operated at different frequencies within the band for which it was designed? Remember I said if, if you operate it outside the, the range that you modeled it, well, the gain may be different. That just makes sense. And what type of computer program technique is commonly used for modeling antennas? MOM, method of moments. And what is the principle of a method of moments analysis? You cut the wire into segments and each having a uniform value of current. And what is the disadvantage of decreasing the number of wire segments in an antenna below the guideline of 10 segments per half wavelength? Your feed point impedance is probably going to be not right. And what does the abbreviation NEC stand for? That's the numerical electromagnetics code. And what type of information can be obtained by submitting the details of a proposed new antenna to a modeling program? All of those things can be outputs of the program, exactly. And what usually occurs if a Yagi antenna is designed solely for maximum forward gain? The front to back ratio will go all to hell. It will decrease. And that is the end of chapter nine. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next week. Dave is up. Yep. Next, next chapter, chapter 10. We'll be doing the whole chapter. Thanks for your attention. Good night.